if you haven't, if you're not familiar, I know some of y'all that know um, Kelsey and I are not familiar with Blue Matter Project. The, the quick backstory is Blue Matter Project was started by my friend Linda um, up in Toronto. And it's a nonprofit that really um, started uh, out of a couple kind of main focuses, I guess, but, uh, but they do a lot of work at connecting people to yoga uh, as kind of adjunctive support for depression and anxiety. Um, and so their whole team, um, including Liz, who's um, on the other Blue Matter login here, um, do a ton of also just kind of finding good online resourcing um, and helping people be able to connect um, to just a lot of good mindfulness um, stuff. And so so they're a good resource. If you're a therapist logging onto this, um, they're a good resource as well. We do some um, really fun trainings on kind of what it looks like to incorporate yoga um, into the counseling process. So yeah. Uh, so y'all, let's um, let's get started. Um, I'll introduce myself for a second, and then um, and then we'll hear from Kelsey. But um, if you don't know me, my name's Aaron Moore. Um, technically, I'm a licensed mental health counselor in Orlando. Um, my wife, Michelle, is also a counselor. Um, we, run an, um, we run an office called Solace Counseling kind of in downtown Orlando. Um, so we've been, um, we've been doing this quite a while now. Um, I've been doing this like 15 years. She's been doing this like 14 years, I think, something like that. Um, so, but we've been also um, just working with Blue Matter Project uh, as kind of faculty for some of the trainings and stuff we do. And so as we talk about this stuff, Liz, um, was one of the ones that kind of suggested you know, talking about some of the questions about therapy and how to connect to therapy. And so I sent out um, some you know, feelers to friends and family of mine, um, and they hit me with a ton of questions um, for us to discuss. And so we'd love to do that and then also um, address some of the things that you guys have stuff too. But Kelsey, do you want to introduce yourself? Sure. Uh, so some of y'all I see uh, that already know me. Uh, I really appreciate you joining. And for those that uh, don't know me, I also appreciate you joining um, and being uh, in a situation where, uh, where it is about being vulnerable in this space. And you might have questions that um, you've never asked before. Um, so I wanted to make myself available for um, any questions that you may have and also speak into my experience um, and how I moved through my own therapy. Um, I actually reached out to Aaron, I guess it was, was it last week when I, uh, I saw Aaron walking down the street? <laughs> I was like, oh, hey, I hadn't seen him in person in a really long time. Um, and he was on a, probably a business call. <laughs> so, um, so we were chatting and I said, you know, I really would like to partner to do something, uh, especially since this is Mental Health Awareness Month. Um, all May long, uh, and my platform is really speaking into mental health since I'm uh, now now going into my 12th year of eating disorder recovery. Um, so my whole platform in creating change and awareness and shift is making sure that people are really aware what opportunities are available out there. Um, yeah. My background is... Um, yeah, my background is um, I'm a former high school teacher, and now I'm a college professor with my PhD specifically in education, but my research is all in mindfulness uh, and utilizing it as an intervention tool to address trauma, compassion, and empathy. So um, that's kind of how my mental health resources fit into uh, what I do on a daily basis. But um, I've also been involved with Blue Matter Project. I was in a training with Aaron. Was that two years ago? It was a year ago. Last oh, year. yeah. Time, I, time is relative. Feels like forever. Uh, yeah. So um, last year, I was affiliated with Blue Matter, um, and that was a wonderful training. So definitely look into more about the Blue Matter Project. I've been introduced to many wonderful people through that, um, and Aaron is also one of those people. Um, so. Any questions, again, that anybody has throughout yeah. this conversation that we're having, know that this is a, an open dialogue um, where we are uh, just acting as vessels to create an open space. Yeah, yeah, thanks, Kelsey. Um, yeah, we'd really love to you know, hear from you all. So please um, you know, fill the chat log with questions if you've got them. Um, I know, um, I mean, I'd love to kind of dive in uh, and and just kind of get get going with some of it because 
Um, some of what people sent me, um, as I posted this a couple days ago, and then some friends of mine um, who I really respect a ton um, came back with just some really wonderful questions, including questions that they got. Um, they actually asked their kids, um, you know, and so it was really cool to hear, you know, from like 10 and 12 year olds, like, you know, what do you, you know, what do they think about kind of going to counseling and stuff like that? So it was neat. Uh, but one of the things, um, I think a good place to kind of start, right, um, is this question of like, how do I find a therapist? You know, um, and actually, if I back up, like just so the question before that, um, we're, Kelsey and I, you'll notice like we're probably going to use the words counseling and therapy interchangeably. Um, you know, one of the things I, I got asked actually last week is, um, are they the same thing? Um, and yes, they are the same thing. Obviously, the word therapy we use, um, you know, we go to a physical therapist, you know, um, you know, there's physical therapists and there's camp counselors. Um, but when we're talking about um, mental health counseling, you know, relationship counseling, we would use counseling and therapy interchangeably. And so you'll notice Kelsey and I do that. But that's actually like a really common question because if nobody's been um, kind of involved in that sphere, then you don't, you kind of don't know if you're looking for a therapist or if you're looking for a counselor. Um, and in Florida, like I said, I'm, I'm technically a licensed mental health counselor. In other states, that license is called other things. It's, it may be called a licensed professional counselor. Um, you know, there's a, a, a something that's kind of an equivalent of a marriage and family therapist. The differences between those are really just a few classes that people take in grad school. And it's often some further focus sometimes, but, um, but they're all licensed kind of in the same way. So we'll use those, um, if we say counselor, if we say therapist, we are really using those interchangeably. Um, Chelsea, is that fair? So, um, it, you know, the question that uh, everybody that everybody actually, uh, my friends and, and even my sister had, had hit them up and said, hit me your questions and stuff. And every one of them started with, how do you find someone? Um, and, and so I, I get that question. Um, yeah, I get that question from friends often is how do they connect with somebody. And, and I think Orlando is a little bit unique. Um, there are places kind of in, in the U.S. Um, and, and Toronto fits this as well. Um, but Orlando, mm -hmm. uh, Orlando is actually like a saturated market of counselors. Totally. Um, you know, there are, there are actually thousands of therapists in Orlando. Um, you know, it, it is, there, there's, there's no shortage, um, you know, and so I think where my office is, I know, I mean, I can name you, you know, multiple ones that are kind of like within two blocks. Um, so it, it's interesting to me always mm -hmm. that it's like, how do we find a therapist? But there really are a ton out there. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and so, I mean, Kelsey, I'd love to hear what you say this, to this in a second, but one of the things I always encourage people, um, and this is going to sound way overly simplistic, but I always encourage people, um, ask your friends. The catch is, and it's most of the time when people are wanting to go to counseling, they're not wanting to tell their friends that they're wanting to go to counseling. Um, you know, that's like the whole mm -hmm. stigma thing, um, which if any of y'all have ever been in workshops I do, I get on super soapbox about that, which I won't today. Um, but it is amazing how many resources our kind of circles have that we're unaware of when we don't talk about it. So part of the biggest thing um, is when there are people kind of in our community that we trust, um, I, I encourage people assume that they probably know someone. So if you have, um, you know, if there are guidance counselors at your kid's school, if they're just guidance counselors, even just know they, they're aware of resources. Um, if you have, you know, if you have friends who are in the medical community, there's a good possibility they may be aware of good resources. Um, if you have, uh, you know, you, you, your own physician, they're going to be a resource. Um, but just our friends and kind of your community, you know, if you have, you know, if you're in a faith community, um, if you have pastors, they usually know people. But um, I, I think one of the main things to kind of think about is the people that, that are just kind of in our lives, um, you know, your good friends down the street may know exactly someone to call, you know, for counseling. We just often don't talk about the subject of counseling or mental health as often, so we don't know who knows what. Um, so that's one of the benefits of kind of, you know, battling the stigma and creating a place where we can talk about this stuff more often is that we actually begin to know the resources that um, our friends have taken advantage of or been aware of in the past, you know. 
Um, Kelsey, I mean, what, what else would you want to add to that? Um, so I definitely agree with what you're saying and when you're speaking in terms of like what's available in Orlando and bigger cities. Um, when I look across the board and where I've been currently living, which is um, like right now I'm in Orlando, but uh, for the past year I've been in the Delta of Mississippi where my university is. So um, when, it, when you speak of resources, um, there's not a lot within these very poor communities that I was working in. Um, and of course the stigma is also blocking them from accessing any information. So that's battle number one. Um, battle number two is there's actually not as many resources available um, and accessible resources where um, insurance might be covering it. So for example, um, the closest resource that my students have um, is of course the counseling center on campus, um, but then they're not always able to access that, especially now um, because they're not at the university. So I definitely think that um, having knowing what resources are available, but also um, being aware that, you know, somebody that you might be giving advice to or a friend or family member who say, hey, check this out. Um, resources might not be available within their specific town. Um, and Aaron, you can definitely speak into this and in, um, the element of crossing state lines and offering counseling. So um, that is also another barrier. Yeah, I think, uh, um, yeah, we'll, we'll come to the state line thing in one second, but what you, what you just said is really huge um, because I know, um, a bunch of y'all that are, I know on this call are, are here because you're trying to kind of know how to be a resource for the people around you. And so um, part of that is being able to kind of answer that question of what resources are available and being really aware there are a lot of communities. And that's what's ironic about Orlando is I can tell you there's 2,000 counselors here, but many of us don't really know that many, you know, because we're unaware of what's there. Um, so I encourage people all the time. Um, build kind of like a little bit of a resource list um, when people around you and yourself, when you're not in crisis. Um, it, so if, if you're kind of going, man, how do I, how am I kind of an asset in my community, care for people? Um, those resources that I mentioned, you know, be, be it um, friends, neighbors, um, pastors, physicians, um, you know, people who do work in mental health, um, psychiatrists, counselors, um, kind of make a list of those um, just in in non-war time so to speak um, so then when your friends um, do kind of have a need you know who to call um, that's really huge uh, and, and one of the things I hear happen a lot is people go okay well I know that's a campus counseling center and I'm not a student right um, UCF actually has a phenomenal resource list of therapists all over Orlando that they put together um, for people who aren't students, you know, so if we have, if there's kind of any open door, if there's a campus in town, if there's anything like that, I encourage people, you start there, um, you begin to kind of look down those roads and, and think through, you know, okay, what am I looking for, what's available, because sometimes we can't find, you know, in that first kind of layer of a resource, we can't find the first person we're looking for, but then we kind of just begin to think, you know, um, who might know somebody, you know, and so, and Kelsey mentioned, you know, just kind of when we run into communities that are underserved, that's a very real reality. Um, and so we have to kind of, I mean, that's something that society-wide society we have to get better at. Um, but it is helpful to think, okay, then where do we go next? And so sometimes we do have to look at resources, you know, out of town. Um, in, in coronavirus times, um, most of us have been doing telehealth. You know, we've been doing video um, sessions with people, uh, which is amazing. It's an amazing resource. Uh, it doesn't, I, I don't think it quite substitutes for like in-person interaction with people, but, um, but it's still, it's something, right? Um, but um, the other thing I would say is when we think about how we're encouraging somebody to look for a therapist or look for a therapist ourselves, um, we're going to look for somebody who's trained. And an easy way to think of that is going to be two things. It's going to be one, somebody who's licensed, meaning that they're licensed, you know, by the state. Um, so in Florida, that would be like a licensed mental health counselor, a marriage and family therapist. In other states, it might be a licensed professional counselor. Um, the other phrase would be somebody who's license eligible, meaning that's somebody who's kind of completed school um, or, you know, is in a graduate program, you know, usually like a master's level or a PhD, uh, and they're working towards licensures, just like we might see 
you know, a physician, you know, in an ER who's still kind of in that process. Um, there are therapists who are working and are trained and are excellent. Um, they're just in those early years out of school. So um, those phrases are really helpful um, to think about just because the, the, the questions of how do I find somebody, um, you know, as the word therapy kind of applies to a lot of things and, you know, and counselor does as well. It's helpful just to go, man, okay, find somebody who is licensed or license eligible. Um, and, and that's a helpful way to think of it. So. And I think uh, bouncing off this question, because um, I saw this was also a question that was listed and uh, this was also a question that I initially had uh, when, and still do when trying to find a really good fit um, is not only the how do we find access to therapy, but also how do we find the right one? Um, so it's, I like to think of it more like I'm going on many different dates um, and not, not to put it in that context, but it's just the easiest way to explain it. Um, I, and this kind of veers off into other directions too, but I'm going to stick with this one topic first. Um, and when you're trying to find a therapist, um, from my own personal experience, and Erin can definitely speak more into this, and anyone can add their own experience if they feel um, that they want to share. Um, but as I've moved throughout my um, counseling journey um, and experiencing numerous types of counseling and um, just where I'm at in like different circumstances in my, amidst my not only recovery journey, but where I'm currently at in my life, um, my different needs of therapy have shifted. So initially when I first got into therapy, it was definitely when I was um, first in the beginning stages of um, recognizing that I had an eating disorder. So this was about um, 15, 16 years ago. So uh, that was very different from where I'm currently at right now and the different types of um, therapy I'm now seeking. So um, it's, and this is also brings up a question like, well, how do I recognize what I need in this time? Um, so that's another question to veer off to. Um, but if you are in the initial stages of um, beginning your therapy journey, um, I would definitely encourage you to just hit up a counselor. Um, that's really first step right away. Um, it's kind of like, I like to think of it like going for my first time to a yoga class. Um, the first big step is actually getting to a class and then trying to practice um, the poses and maybe finding out that vinyasa practice or ashtanga practice maybe doesn't work for you and maybe yin yoga is what you really need right now. So um, that would be quite similar into how I began my journey and trying to find um, what was the best fit and then what I liked, what I didn't like. But I would definitely say that the first step is just going to a counselor yeah yeah i i would agree um I, my friend rich um he actually sent me a note this morning um, and he said that he felt like the biggest issue that uh, everybody gets hung up on is how to identify and make sure they're choosing the right counselor um, and he said for him that always felt like the kind of you know analysis paralysis point where he just got stuck um and, and i think that's really common um you know which i mean for for any of us and especially like and most people do a Google search. And if a thousand people show up on a Google search, um, that feels a little daunting. Um, I, I would completely agree with you, Kelsey. I think it's really good. And, and I would kind of highlight two thoughts. One, um, if, if you're trying to help somebody find a therapist or you're looking for a therapist, if there's something that you're really clear you want to work on, that's something really specific. You know, Kelsey, you mentioned eating disorders. That's a very specified kind of area. Addiction is a specified area. Um, marriage counseling is a specific area, right? Um, not all counselors work with everything. So if you're, if you're aware there's something really specific, then that can help and go, okay, how do I look for a counselor? You know, and I can kind of research counselors that work with this specific thing. I can research counselors that work with eating disorders or counselors that work with addiction. Um, I think for many people, we're not sure what the thing is. You know, we just know that there's something that we kind of need to get into and we're not sure what it is. Um, and so I loved what Rich told me because um, he said, actually, he said that he felt um, that his, his experience um, was about forward motion and just taking a first step. And it was in counseling 
um, where he discovered what he needed and what felt like it worked. Um, and then out of, you know, being in therapy, that then he felt like he was able to make um, what he called kind of those informed and experience-based decisions, but he didn't know the answer until he went. Um, and, and so I love that. I think it's a helpful thing to kind of remind ourselves to not get stuck in the paralysis point, but to go, okay, if I know I can find somebody who's trained um, and somebody who is knowledgeable and, you know, and, and, and how do I kind of just, you know, step in and, and get started. And in that process, um, you know, we can kind of begin to begin to sort through and figure out, man, maybe I don't like this style. Maybe this doesn't really work. Um, maybe this doesn't really drive with me. Maybe I need something different. Um, and, and I would encourage you, um, as, as a therapist, um, I love it when people are kind of wondering that. I think that's a great thing. It, you know, that's not, I, I don't ever take that as like a personal, you know, kind of affront to me. Um, because I know Michelle's a very different counselor than me. And so sometimes people probably, you know, do better seeing her than seeing me. And, and so um, I think the, the moral of the story can be, how do we just kind of get going? And then in that process, begin to think through, okay, does this feel like this is meeting needs? And if not, then do we need to change course? You know? And that was actually the next thing that I wanted to identify. And in my dating analogy, when do you know when it's the, the correct step to break up? Good question. Um, <laughs> so it's, it's um, when I've been thinking back about like how I've broken up with my therapist and it doesn't sound, don't take it that's the wrong way. It's never aggressive. <laughs> um, so I was able to identify, and this was at, after some time with, within this therapist interaction, when I knew the issue that I had come to the therapist with, I felt it had personally resolved. Um, and maybe that was the very specific form of therapy uh, they offered. And then I might want to move on to something else specific that I'd like to address in my own personal circumstance. Um, but maybe the counselor that I'm seeing at the time um, might have a very specific um, therapeutic method that they're able to offer that I could also still continue to see them. Um, so that would be uh, one element. Another element um, that I've seen just, again, with my own personal experience from the seat of the patient, at the seat of the client, um, is that if I am, and de uh, definitely speak into this, Erin, because I don't, the, you have definitely more experience with this. Um, if I am feeling like I need a break from therapy, not in the sense of like, I'm, I'm no longer needing to to address this um, more in the sense of I am feeling like my own brain cognitively needs a break um, I wouldn't say I've never personally stopped going to therapy I've taken some time where I wasn't seeing my therapist for maybe like a month or two months just because I needed to let myself sit um, with some of the stuff that I was addressing and I needed to sit with that myself course the therapist was also there to um, be there whenever I needed and needed to make an appointment but I wasn't necessarily breaking up with them I was taking like a time out um, and that's something that I, I identified that I needed and of course talked to the therapist about uh, within that process and context yeah I love um, I, I love like the kind of key thing in what you're saying is that you talk to them about it um, and, and so, I mean, my, my encouragement is, I think we kind of recognize one thing, like that the counseling kind of process is a fluid process um, because I think as a client, sometimes um, we kind of approach the process as though there's like really set, like we're supposed to do it this one way, um, you know, and obviously like in any profession, there's boundaries and, you know, standards and stuff like that. Um, but, but I love Kelsey, what you're describing is that you and you, that you talk to your counselor about it. And I think that's my number one kind of recommendation, you know, in that is um, if, if you kind of find yourself with a counselor and you're wondering if it's a fit, um, talk to the counselor about it. Um, because that's going to come back to uh, what are the goals that I'm kind of looking to accomplish? Uh, what are the needs that I feel like kind of need to be met? And, and often I, I run into, you know, conversations with people all the time. Um, where they haven't felt comfortable talking about that with their counselor. 
Um, and so uh, that's the that stuff. My encouragement is always, man, feel free to put those questions on the table um, because it's in that process that you're going to figure out is this the counseling relationship that that's, that's going to be able to be helpful in that. Um, a couple questions that I kind of that I got sent to me before this um, that really fit in line with this um, is that like how do I know if a counselor is a good fit and and how do I, how long do I stick it out? Um, and another friend of mine, he, his phrasing was, um, am I prepared to commit myself to more than one session if the first time doesn't go really well? Um, and so, uh, you know, I, I want to answer this specifically because uh, I think they're really good. Um, I, I do think sometimes, like, you know, uh, we do, I run into, you know, situations where folks approach with a lot of pressure on, like, an initial interaction. And I think that's, that speaks to kind of how we are as people. Um, where we kind of go, man, okay, I want to come in and I need, I need to tell you some things and you need to tell me some answers and some things to do. Um, and so we should be able to kind of tie this together in like two or three meetings. Um, and, and I think that speaks to kind of just some deeper stuff and just how we are as people. Um, but we're way too complex for that, you know, um, you know, just with what goes on in our hearts. So I think, you know, in terms of counseling process, it's usually a lot longer than that. And it's helpful for us to be open to that. Um, that said, I think it's, I think it's important sometimes to go, Hey, it might take a few times before I feel like the counselor and I start clicking and we begin to find a rhythm. Um, and so kind of expecting that, uh, is kind of important. Um, I think, you know, if you're kind of, you know, five or six sessions in and really feeling like somebody doesn't hear you and you're not really, um, you know, not feeling like it's getting better, then, you know, you might kind of talk about and think about if it's worthwhile, you know, pursuing another situation. Um, but I think, you know, we need to kind of be willing to give it a little bit of time. Uh, and then, and then it's, and then it's always okay to reassess. It's always okay to ask those questions. Uh, you know, uh, some of the things I think, um, and Kelsey, I think we talked about some of this last year at, at Blue Matter, but, um, but some of the hallmarks is, um, you need to feel like the counselor actually does care. Um, if you don't feel like your, your counselor, uh, and if they don't, if it doesn't feel like there's empathy there uh, and like there's real care there, then um, that's gonna be a hard place to feel really comfortable. Um, you know, and, and I, I think, you know, we need, to feel, we need to feel safe and respected, you know. Um, and, and I think Kelsey, I, I know, you know, um, I know you can probably speak to that too, but I think counseling is a vulnerable place, but it's very possible to know that we're safe and still feel vulnerable. You know, I think that's a, I think that's a good thing. That was the exact question that I was going to ask you, and you kind of already answered it. So my my question for you, Aaron, actually was, um, as I was thinking back again amongst my experience, um, how can you, as a client, identify between uncomfortability and uh, safe space? So meaning, Ooh. like, um, how can I know as a client if i am feeling uncomfortable because my some of the layers that i'm peeling back are what i've come to address or whether or not this is actually a safe space uh between me and my counselor dude hit me with like a million dollar question nice um man um i think um <laughs> that connects to the whole that connects to the next question I was going to go to as well. My sister sent me one. And she says, "Why does it sometimes it feel like counseling makes it feel worse before it feels better?" Um, you know, and and I think you know often um, you know we're wrestling with difficult things, which is what Kelsey's speaking to. And so when we're walking into you know a therapy setting, um, and and I'm talking about you know either present you know hurts and struggles or past you know hurts and struggles, um, there's pain there, and pain feels vulnerable you know, I think it is, is, you know, it, it feels really disruptive. Um, and so um, I think that's, that's part of one of the reasons why counseling kind of needs to take a little while um, at times is because it takes a while to kind of build trust with somebody. You know, it takes a while to go, hey, okay, I feel comfortable enough to sit with somebody to allow myself to be uncomfortable. And that might sound like a kind of ridiculous saying, but I think there's a space where we can go, am I comfortable enough with you that I can step in to what things that I know are going to create significant discomfort 
Um, but, but I feel like you can handle it. And I feel like I, I trust you enough to be willing to go there. Um, because those happen on different levels, you know, uh, it's a very different thing to experience stuff that feels really vulnerable and feels really overwhelming. That's a very different sensation than feeling really unsafe with somebody, you know. Um, and so I, I think that's what's one of the cool things that happens kind of in counseling. And that's one of the reasons why I love doing it as a job is because we get these like kind of beautiful um, times to spend with somebody where we're talking about really difficult things. Uh, and, and it can feel really uncomfortable when we're talking about old pain, um, but, um, but we, do, we can do it in a really like, safe uh, and secure way, which I think can be really healing you know, for all of us. So, yeah. Yeah, and it's never fun. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, oh, you create on, a really wonderful, yeah, it's, <laughs> it's, um, I just always think about like, when I first got out of um, rehab, um, I went to a therapist that specialized in eating disorder therapy and, um, she knew exactly what I needed at the time, uh, which was a lot of hard love, um, because I was being very stubborn and, um, wanting to go back to old coping tools that I thought were my safety net. Um, so having a therapist that, um, really address that uncomfortability was very necessary for me at the time. Uh, but she also did it in a loving way where it almost, it, she felt like a, um, almost like a family member where she was doing it from a place of love, uh, even though it sucked. So it's, um, it's, it's never easy to address your own shit. <laughs> um, it's, but I think that identifying what is uncomfortable and also what is safe is highly necessary. Yeah, definitely. Um, and and I, I think um, uh, one of the questions that, that I was sent um, is, is the idea of how do I know if counseling would be helpful for me? You know, um, and, and so, I mean, I think like we even kind of run into that question a little bit there. Um, you know, when we're going, okay, it, it, I know it's going to be uncomfortable. Is it even, is it going to be helpful? Like, is it needed? Um, and so uh, when we don't have something that's easily identifiable, um, you know, I think sometimes, you know, we've kind of gone, man, I don't know if counseling, I don't know if it's that bad, um, you know, and, and I, I run into that a ton. Um, and, and so another way to kind of phrase that question would be, at what point does somebody need counseling, right? And, and, and just to put that in perspective, um, if I said that somebody needed therapy, that's actually a highly stigmatized statement. Like most of us through kind of like the stigma lens that we've kind of been given in our life to, for somebody to need therapy uh, was actually more of an insult um, and an indictment uh, of weakness or moral failing, you know, or something like that. Um, and so that kind of trickle down effect leaves a lot of us going, man, I don't know if counseling is appropriate. You know, I, don't, I don't know if I'm that bad yet. Um, and, and so I would just, I, I would encourage all y'all pay attention because a lot of us have kind of that internal language of going, well, it's really not that bad, you know, or my kid's not struggling that bad. I'm not struggling that bad. Marriage isn't that bad. Um, you know, and so I would re I really encourage folks, if, if we're kind of going, man, I don't really, I don't think it's necessary. It would probably be helpful. You know, uh, you know, we kind of tend to approach it, I think, because of like the hangovers of 100 years of stigma, we approach it as like, you know, the house has to be on fire before we call somebody with a hose, um, you know, and, and so being able to go, yeah, counseling would be really helpful uh, because all of us, and the same reason like mindfulness stuff is really helpful, um, you know, all of us can do to kind of grow in relationship skills, can grow in empathy, um, and can probably learn some better ways of relating with ourselves. You know, life's hard. Many, you know, many of us have kind of gotten bumps and bruises along the way. Um, so uh, my point is there's, there's not, there's not like a qualifying level of hardship that somebody has to endure to qualify themselves to get to go to counseling. Like that thinking is just completely not helpful. Like, and so when we hear that in ourselves or in others, um, I think it's, it's really important to kind of shut that down and go, no, um, it counseling, it, I, I mean, it, far too often counseling, unfortunately, is a luxury, um, in, of availability. Um, but, um, but it, it should be something that's open and, and available to all of us because it can just be beneficial. We don't have to qualify for it, so to speak. So, yeah.
Um, speaking of what you were saying, Aaron, and um, I, I put a post on social media about this that was discussing that I think of, um, I had to shift my mindset uh, pretty drastically early on um, and how I thought of what I termed therapy. Um, but now it's something that I identify as a need within my life uh, that is almost as a, I use the example of me getting my chin waxed. I'm going to be straight up honest <laughs> that I have to go and do these certain appointments in order to keep um, the car running. So um, therapy yeah. is definitely one of those things that I consider a high priority on my list. Um, but initially I was doing it, uh, solely because I thought I had to, um, where I felt like I was too far gone. Um, but now after shifting that mindset, um, I definitely consider it something that is necessary only like kind of like lifting a weight, um, mm -hmm. retraining my brain and then identifying new perspectives and new ways of speaking, not only to my, yeah. myself, but also to um, my other relationships. So I, right before I got married, um, my husband and I were discussing about going to marriage counseling. We're like, ah, marriage is fine. We don't need to go. And then uh, we're like, no, we really do need to knowing that um, we, we already see our own separate counselors. Um, really the necessity of going was to learn new tools to have um, different ways to speak to each other and understand each other rather than um, continuing on business as casual and then maybe something happens down the road that I could have identified early on. Yeah, which is so good. Um, I think it's just, it's funny to me how like in terms of mental health um, and counseling, we we have never really thought preventatively, you know? Um, we've always, every, all, all of our like public approaches have always been crisis oriented. You know, oh my gosh, the house is on fire. Now we've got to do something. We've never thought, man, like what would be supportive during a really hard season? You know, like we lose a loved one, school gets really hard, kids are difficult. Like if we begin to think more in terms of like just ongoing self care, um, and even preventative stuff, it'd be so much more helpful, um, you know, but we have, but we've never really been trying to think that way. Um, I want to jump to um, some other questions I was sent, because I think they're really good. Um, so much of what I got from uh, a few folks um, was, was about this, you know, the kind of the questions of like, how, how do I find a counselor? But then how does it actually start? You know, uh, and like, well, what do I actually have to do? And, uh, and, and my friend Rich, who I mentioned, um, he actually um, sent me some questions um, from one of his kids, um, and, and I thought they were so good. Um, he said uh, just some questions that, that he's heard of, um, you know, one, like, how does this person know how to help me? Um, how is talking about this going to change the way I feel? You know, and, um, and, and I, think I think they're really valid questions of, like, what, and I think that speaks back to, you know, the question of, like, what do I do when I go in, you know? Um, and, and so one of the things that I, I find myself telling people all the time um, is um, yeah, counseling isn't usually about going to see somebody and having them tell you what to do. You know, one of the phrases I heard one of my mentors tell me a long time ago was good advice is kind of bad counseling. Um, and I was like, okay, you know, uh, and, and what they were getting at is um, usually what's needed is not like just the three steps to fix everything, even though that's what often we want, you know, when we're in pain. Um, and so I think sometimes, you know, I encourage folks, um, if you're starting counseling, um, try to give yourself permission to not approach it as, okay, just go in and tell me what to do. You know, if I can go in and I can do these three things, um, you know, then just tell me what to do to fix the problem. Um, go in and, and just kind of begin to be curious and, and kind of walk into that process. And one of the things that I think um, my friend's kid hit on so well, it was, this feeling of if I'm going to kind of go into counseling, I need to be able to tell them the right things so that then they can help me. And for any of us who have ever struggled with like depression or even like anxiety, right? Um, I mean, there's, it's a common feeling for many of us that it's like, how the hell do I tell you what I'm struggling with when I don't understand it? Like I don't have words for it myself. So how do I walk into a stranger's office 
and like share it with them and in a way that then they're going to be able to like tie it up with a bow and hand it back to me. Um, and, and so, you know, um, my encouragement is, is always to go, man, um, the goal is to kind of get in the door. You don't have to expect anything else of yourself than that. Um, and so if you're thinking about this, even for people around you, even for yourself, um, the goal is to get in the door. Um, because, you know, no counselor is going to expect anybody to walk in with a 10 point, you know, explanation of their life. Um, definitely not going to expect anybody to walk in with like 10 questions that they want answered. You know, um, that's not like that kind of mentality is usually more oppressive, I think, of ourselves than helpful. Um, so my encouragement is to, you know, always to folks to um, focus on how do I get in the door and then, uh, and then knowing um, that I'm seeing somebody who's, tr uh, you know, trained at this in their job, that they're going to know the questions to ask me, you know, uh, and I have a great opportunity to be honest and to reply and to respond um, and to, to, to invite more questions, but, but they're going to know the questions to ask, um, you know, and it's not on me to kind of walk in feeling like I have this 10 point plan that I'm going to present, you know, I'm not, I'm not presenting like a science project that they're going to grade. Um, but I get to, you know, kind of walk in and if I get in the door, that's usually a win. So. Uh, something that is also very encouraging in my uh, own experience is, um, and actually I see that Sarah, Sarah's on the call, uh, who is trained in a very wonderful uh, method of play therapy. Um, so sometimes cognitive based therapy didn't work out for me. Um, especially, and I can speak into several times where it just wasn't beneficial, um, especially during my PhD program where I had a, um, a minor traumatic brain injury. Um, and I also was using my brain so much that those two items, I wasn't able to fully access how I was feeling. Um, so using, uh, I think it was sandbox therapy, uh, Sarah had recommended a uh, one of the counselors that she was trained under um, to use sandbox therapy, which was something very new to me. Um, but it was something that I was able to do at the time that I could uh, use something other than my words to address what was going on. The other time that was um, highly beneficial for not using more of the cognitive based therapy uh, was during my experience in rehab. Uh, where I was super anxious, depressed, um, going through a lot of stuff, that it was more beneficial for me to experience art therapy um, rather than continuing to discuss what was happening. I could uh, vocalize it by painting, um, by creating something, and then using that as a tool to voice what I was feeling. So it's, again, there's so many different tools out there um, that you can Google uh, who's trained in it, maybe something that you didn't even know was out there. You can ask around. Um, but I found it very encouraging that I didn't have to always talk all the time, even though I do love to talk. <laughs> That's so good, though, um, because there really are, um, there really are so many different, you know, kind of types and different modalities that take place in therapy. Um, and so, you know, it, I mean, I think one of the hallmarks that we're saying today is for anybody to feel free to ask those questions, right? Um, because as much as like you can kind of get in the door and go, okay, I can trust that the therapist knows where to go. If there's things that we're curious about, you need to feel free to put those on the table. And so like Kelsey is a great example of, man, my brain is freaking tired. Um, you know, like I, I, this, this is not, so if I feel like this isn't working, I can put on the table that this isn't working what are other possibilities? And so you end up with things like sand tray therapy and art therapy, um, and there's tons of different options there. Um, you know, trauma is a great example. Um, you know, trauma treatment has had like a renaissance in the past 15 years where there's more good research and modalities in trauma therapy than ever before. Um, and so, you know, for somebody, um, you know, looking to do counseling, you know, for old trauma, um, there's wonderful options um, of all different types of therapy that engage the brain and the body in different ways. Um, but finding yourself um, with a therapist who's, you know, got a good amount of training, um, then, you know, they should be able to help determine, hey, you know what, um, we could keep doing this, 
Um, but I actually think this one, I actually think doing sand tray therapy would like change your world. So let me, you know, let me refer you to somebody else. And, and so, I mean, I think that's part of the benefit of getting in the door um, with somebody that we feel good about, um, getting in the door with somebody that we feel kind of respected and cared for by, um, then they can help us determine, hey, we really need to pull in some other resources here. We need to find somebody who does this specific type of trauma work or these specific type of addiction groups or something like that. Um, that can be really, really helpful. Um, I know we got, um, we got about like nine or 10 more minutes. So if any of y'all have questions, throw them in the chat so we make sure we get to them, okay? Um, and so, yeah, I mean, Kelsey, did you have other ones that we, I mean, I, I got a ton, but we can, we're picking and choosing. So anything else on there you want to make sure we got? I mean, I think that this, the conversation that I would like to bring up probably would be best reserved for a totally different chat. Um, which is more equity based um, and how to transcend into therapy when we might not have the means to do so. Um, that is a conversation that would be very long. Um, so, so, but I do think that there are resources out there, even despite not having um, potentially insurance. So would, would you happen to have those resources that you could put in the chat? Um, not off the top of my head. Um, you know, I do, um, I mean, we have, um, if anybody wants a list for Orlando, um, drop your name in there and I can email you some, cause they're, um, I mean, I think what I would say to that is, um, if, cause I, I know, I know some of y'all are on here because you're really trying to be an asset in your community. Um, make sure your list, um, of resources that you build is available to a lot of people that don't live near you, look like you, act like you, and definitely don't think like you. Um, you know, that, that's huge. Um, and, and that's huge across, like, across a lot of different degrees, right? Um, even just to the sense that, like, um, you know, um, counseling needs to be economically affordable. Sometimes that means using insurance. For a lot of the population, it means not using insurance because their insurance is shit to begin with. Um, you know, so it's like, oh, man, how do we know what resources are available? Um, there's also a, a really good um, consideration to go, man, um, a counselor, and this is kind of going a little sideways, but hang with me. Um, it, you don't have to go find a counselor that's lived the exact story you've lived. You know, I, I hear that often because it's like, hey, well, if you haven't struggled with addiction, then how do you know how to work with somebody who struggles with addiction? Um, a, a, a good counselor should be trained to work with things that they necessarily haven't gone through the exact same thing. Most of our stories are really varied, um, but um, there are places where cultural competency is really really, really important. Um, and so, you know, if you're building a list, um, being able to find some people that understand, you know, kind of cross-cultural experience um, and, and can address like the therapeutic process that way, it's really, really important. Um, you know, and, and sometimes just really good space of being able to go, okay, I, I need to have, you know, I need to have counselors for, you know, that, that work really closely with African-American community. I also need to have counselors that work with veterans. You know, like, because I mean, sometimes, sometimes that specific experience is important um, and being able to be competent in that is, is really, really huge. Um, Aaron, there was a question yes. that was asked that um, is a really good question. Um, and I specifically think it's, uh, I'm, I'm thinking it's with minors, um, but the question is, what if you have to convince your parents that you could use counseling? Yeah, um, that's actually really similar. Another question that we, that we had sent in. Um, to the Blue Matter account was just uh, that, like, what if, what if my family and the people around me are not supportive of what I need? Uh, and so, um, I mean, let's, let's take both of those. One, um, that sucks if we have to convince the people around us that we need care. Um, so, um, I mean, that, that's just so unfortunate. Uh, and, and, and I mean, it makes me sad um, when that's the case um, because that really should not be the case. Um, at the same time, it often is the case because many, many times the people around us, um, you know, there can be a million reasons why they don't understand the struggles that we're in or the pain we've gone through. Um, and sometimes it's just how they view counseling itself. You know, many of us grew up um, in kind of subcultures where counseling was not okay and not accepted. You know, those still thrive. So um, unfortunately it's still there. Um, I think a couple things. One, um, find people that do get it and are supportive. 
talk to other people, um, not to like do an end run around them necessarily, but like talk to other friends and other mentors and other people who get it and are going to be supportive because we all need people around us who are being supportive. Um, you know, we just need that encouragement and that care alongside of us Two, Those people may also be able to kind of stand alongside you. Um, and sometimes those end up being the people that can help the parents get it. You know, if there are other, you know, kind of authority figures or, you know, supportive figures that can come alongside and help the parents kind of realize um, that, you know, just that that's a supportive thing. Um, I think that's, that's huge. Um, I think it, it, beyond the parent people, well, let me say one more thing about that. Um, it does become an issue um, when, you know, counseling, it, it's, a, it's a medical service. So often it requires a parent's consent for somebody to go to counseling, right? Um, now, here's the catch, though. Every state actually um, has um, different ages that a minor can request to go to counseling um, without parents knowing and consent. Um, and so whatever state you're in, um, and Canada's the same, look up um, kind of in your municipality what are the, um, what's the actual age of when somebody can go um, without parents' consent, when somebody can go against parents' consent, um, because often it's, it's younger, often it's younger than 18. It's not always, but often it is, um, because it's most, it's most of the laws say that, you know, a minor can't seek medical treatment. So that's, that's important to kind of note. Um, on a broader scale, um, I, I want to reiterate, we need people around us who are supportive um, and so as painful as it is when people don't get it, um, my, my encouragement is don't let that be a hindrance to finding people that are supportive and to, you know, to reaching out for help. Um, because often it's, it, it ends up being like maybe in the counseling setting that we find kind of the words and, and the ability to actually help people understand, you know, what we're going through. What about uh, school counselors? If they're a minor, um, and I know that the resources for school counseling are now becoming like pretty slim since they're having to go to different schools. Um, what about access to school counselors? Yeah, I mean, I think school counselors are a good kind of frontline resource um, because school counselors should have resources in the community to be able to connect somebody for longer term counseling. You know, um, some of our best friends work in the school system here in Orlando. Um, and so we'll work together all the time, you know, when there's families that they're trying to support, you know, they may kind of ask us to be involved. And then when, when, we, when I'm working with a student that goes to their school, I'm like, hey, you need to go and, and see my friend because he's going to be a great resource for you on campus and a great safe place if you need an open door, you know, when the days are really hard. Um, so those can be really, really great. Really great. Yeah. Any other questions that y'all want to throw in there? I answered everything you need to know about counseling. Kelsey and I just killing it. Yeah, um, yeah. Liz, Liz, um, Liz just sent me a, a note there. Said so, um, you can also get uh, get referrals from um, hospitals as well. Um, you know, again, uh, man, um, build a resource list of, of what's available in your community, uh, and and build that. Like, like I said, don't don't wait till the crisis happens. Um, I promise you, if you have that list, um, you'll have to use it. You just will. Um, it will like it will come across your path if you know the resource. Um, and so, uh, a couple things to have on that: um, ha and find a couple counselors in your area that work with addiction. Um, you know, find a couple counselors that work with specific things like anxiety and trauma and depression. Um, definitely find a counselor that works with eating disorders because eating disorders are very specific. Somebody needs to be trained in that. Um, it's not something that everyone is trained in. Just because somebody's a therapist does not mean they know how to work with eating disorders. Um, but then find out, like, what hospitals in your area um, are good, have a good psychiatric receiving facility. You know, which another way to say that is um, if somebody's really struggling and they may be thinking of hurting themselves, you know, maybe having suicidal thoughts, um, at 2 a.m. on a Saturday, where do you go? Who do you call? Um, you know, here in Orlando, um, Central Florida Behavioral is probably who I refer to the most. Um, you know, 211 is another good resource. Um, you know, Crisis Text Line is an amazing um, nationwide resource. I think they go into Canada now, too. Um, but, um, but Canada, through Bell, you guys have a bunch of resources as well. Um, but know those, um, because if a crisis happens and we know where to go, um, if you're sitting with somebody who's struggling just as a friend, um, knowing, hey, I know who we can call. Oh my gosh, that feels going to feel so much more comforting to them than saying, hey, let me Google a therapist. 
you know? Um, and so that goes all the way across the board. That even just goes down to knowing therapists that if your friend comes to you and says they're struggling, being able to say, hey, well, I know somebody, um, you know? And, and I've had people over the years, like, call me and be like, hey, I just want to hear about what you do just to see if you're, like, a complete, like, wacko or if I could send my friends to you. Um, you know, and I was like, cool, I'll buy you a coffee. Come on by, like, come on by and you can see I'm hopefully not weird. Um, and, and that'd be great, you know, so. We have a question from Tyler. Um, how would you answer a client who has never been in therapy, who is asking, what do you believe the goal of therapy is? Man, um, Tyler, you should answer that. Um, you know, therapeutic training. Um, so, um, so man, um, yeah, um, I'm laughing because Tyler's a therapist. And so, um, he does, that's always a tough question because, uh, as, as a therapist, like the, th like my goal, isn't a goal for somebody, you know, um, you know, my goal as a therapist, I would tell anybody, my goal as a therapist is to help somebody get to the goals that they want to get to. Um, and sometimes that includes kind of like refining goals a little bit. You know, sometimes, um, you know, that, um, uh, sometimes that includes, you know, kind of going, man, okay. Um, sometimes our goals need to get bigger and better. You know, um, when we're in pain, um, our goal is usually to get out of pain. Um, and, and sometimes, you know, once we kind of get out of pain, then our goal becomes, man, what does growth look like? What is, uh, what is life being more fulfilling look like? Like what, what is kind of you, um, finding a way to be the, the healthiest and fulfilled you can be? you know, look like, um, even in the midst of life being difficult and hard and at times sad and at times overwhelming, um, you know, then well, what does that look like? And that looks different for everybody. But, but I think it's helpful to think the goal isn't just to get out of pain. Um, and the goal is definitely not to fix a problem. The goal is to kind of strengthen, you know, our whole selves so that we can deal with life um, kind of in the full range of it, you know. So I know we've got to wrap up in a second. Um, I know Kelsey's got to jump off because um, I think she's got it at 2 o'clock. Um, if anybody has any further questions, um, you know, you can um, send them in to the Blue Matter account. You can send them to Kelsey. You can send them to me. Does anybody have anything else that we want to um, address real quick? Any burning questions? That I might Erica missed? put a good resource um, down below for an employee assistance program. Yeah. Uh, so you can look at that in the chat. Um, but if you do have, again, any follow-up questions, for sure, reach out. Yeah, yeah, cool. Well, thanks. Thanks, Kelsey. Thanks, guys. Thanks for your questions.